Hi, friends. Today I am joined by Cindy Rollins. Cindy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Amy. I'm excited to be here and talk to the moms. <laughs> Yes, well, Cindy is a veteran, retired homeschooling mom of nine, and she inspired a whole generation of homeschool moms to explore the philosophy of Charlotte Mason and to include morning time in their homeschool day as she blogged through her own homeschooling journey. Now, she continues to encourage homeschool moms as a writer, speaker, and as co-host of the Literary Life podcast, which is always a treat for my earbuds. <laughs> Well, Cindy, here at the beginning, could you just tell us a little bit about your family and how you first came to start homeschooling? Yeah, so um, I graduated from high school and went on to college, but I didn't stay in college very long because I got married. But I, had, oh, I, I was always a voracious reader. And as I, when I'm read, as I was reading these old classic books, I was starting to get increasingly alarmed that of how much I didn't know and how much these books took for granted that you knew. And I, you know, I was having to constantly go back and try to figure out what I was supposed to read next. And when I, so I was very upset about having made straight A's in school and not, and, and I felt like I didn't have an education. And so the first time I heard about homeschooling was with um, Raymond Moore on the radio, which many, many people, that was the first time he was on Focus on the Family. But I heard him talking and I thought, oh my goodness, that's what I'm going to do. I want to do that. Um, because Just because really I felt like my own education had been inadequate. And I knew that, um, you know, the chances are my husband and I were planning to be missionaries at that point. And I, I knew we weren't going to have this huge income to send our kids to private school. So I didn't even have that option. I thought, oh, I either have to, it's either public school or homeschool. And um, of course, we didn't have any children <laughs> at that point. These are, I always say these were my imaginary children. Um, but by the time they came around, we were very entrenched in the idea of homeschooling them. And that's how we got started. And then how did your philosophy or approach to education change over the years of your homeschool journey? Well, when I first started, I, thankfully, when my, I had two little boys, and I, I picked up a copy of Susan Schaefer Macaulay's For the Children's Sake at a bookstore. I didn't even know it was a homeschooling book or because it really wasn't necessarily a homeschooling book. I didn't know, but I didn't know it would affect my philosophy in any way. But really what it did was change my whole entire life. Um, so I read that book. I brought it home, sat down, started reading it. And, and I, th I thought, this is exactly what I want for my children. This is what I want. And so, of course, at that point, I was introduced to the ideas of Charlotte Mason through that book. And those books were, Charlotte's actual books were being republished by the Andreolas. And so I, I was able, my sister-in-law actually bought me as a baby gift for my fourth baby, those books. And I started reading those. And of course, this was all pre-internet. There wasn't any, there weren't any groups talking about all this stuff. There were just me and the books and um, I, it, it just, so I began what I ended up calling morning time as my um, reaction really to Susan Schaefer Macaulay's book. Um, I just thought, oh, this is how I can have this in the day and this is how I can have, this is how I can have this living environment in the day. And so morning time, which I became kind of known for, really grew out of just reading for the children's sake. You know, as I have had so many different people on this interview series, that book keeps coming <laughs> up, keeps coming up. I remember my own mom reading that and I, I saw her give, you know, or lend out that book to many people in my growing up years. Uh, I think Dr. Grant mentioned that, Kathy White's mentioned that book. So many people um, look to that book as sort of changing their ideas about education. Yeah, it, it really was transformational. And what it did, it didn't tell you what to do. It just gave you a vision. And, and it's really hard to find another book that, that draws that vision so well as that book did. Yeah. Well, is there anything that particularly surprised you over the years about your experience homeschooling or, or morning time or sort of Charlotte Mason education? <laughs> yeah, my children surprised me. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, it, 
I, I, you know, I was a young mom and I had it all figured out and that was not exactly how life went. Um, Ideas have consequences, and I had good ideas that were coming my way, thank the Lord, and those did have consequences, but we also had the realities of just a large family, um, eight boys, um, financial difficulties, all the things that come into life were hitting us at the same time as we're, you know, we're living in this dream world of ideals of how we want our homeschool to look. So I think the reality of everyday life mixed with the romantic ideals, um, you know, there was quite a bit of clash at that point. Um, but I, being the ultra romantic that I am, I was able to um, muddle through that and continue on. So Yeah, I was telling my husband recently, you know, I just longed for those days in a sense from when I was like 17 to 23. Everything was so clear to me. I always knew what to do. I always knew what everyone else should do too. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And now suddenly things are, you know, I don't actually want to go back there because God has been faithful to humble me and to yes. satisfy me and um, often humiliate me. <laughs> Sometimes that's part of being humbled. But um, yeah, there's, there's that idealism when you start out and then you're like, wait, my children are their own people and yes. not the Holy Spirit. Go figure. <laughs> Yes, children have a way of being their own selves, and I was watching a TV show with my husband. We watched this little show together, and um, one of the young girl in that show was telling her mom, you know, oh, this is how you do it, and her mom said, well, motherhood is a little bit more complicated than that. She said, you try to do your best, and um, your, a mother doesn't always have all the answers. Um, when you're real young, and maybe we're supposed to be that way, when we're real young, we, we have hope that we have all the answers. But like you said, we have to humble ourselves as we go, as we come up with the fact that we don't have all the answers. The great news is we have somewhere to go with that. We have the Lord, and he does have all the answers. Um, he doesn't always give them to us in the way that we, you know, like sending us, he doesn't float down little messages on parachutes for us. But he, he does develop that relationship with us that really is far more important than every answer to every problem. Yes. Oh, amen. That is my ultimate hope as a homeschool mom, for sure. <laughs> I mean, we could just stop it right there. There you go. There's the wisdom for the day. <laughs> so in my parts of the internet, people love to talk about morning time and Charlotte Mason and classical education and I love that, and it's exciting, but I know there are a lot of new homeschool moms coming in um, to the homeschool community this fall, and it can be a little overwhelming because a lot of times within those topics, it can be communicated as if here's the one right way to do these things, or, you know, the one right way to be the perfect homeschool mom or the perfect, you know, morning time mom, and that can be a real heavy burden. So what would be um, some advice or tips you would have for moms to kind of sift through the noise, and, and what does it look like to really have this kind of lovely education for our children? Yeah, one of the things, like when it comes to morning time, I, you know, I have a little morning time handbook and it's a full fledged what, you know, it's what we did for 30 years and how it developed, but it didn't start out like that. So I really hate when people get that and they think, oh, let's plug in our two hour morning time. And um, that, that happened organically in our family as we saw what would fit in our family. And I, and I think that goes for Charlotte Mason. I think it goes for classical education. Um, we have to start at ground zero kind of where, in our families and take the ideas and slowly begin working them into our families and, and not um, get way ahead of ourselves philosophically and start doing things, you know, because someone has told us this is the only way to do it. I know in the Charlotte Mason community, there's a lot of that word purity, um, how to have pure Charlotte Mason. I've read all of Char Charlotte Mason's books and I've read them more than once. And I don't think Charlotte would be happy about that. I think that she wanted it to be living which means it cannot be something you just plug and go. Right. And you know, it's interesting because one of the things I often tell people is that it's better to start with something 
simple and even imperfect, but do it yeah. consistently and joyfully than it is to come up with some big glorious plan that just stresses everybody out. And then you kind of don't actually end up doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so as someone's coming in and gets all excited about these wonderful ideas and this new way of approaching education, um, it can be tempting to kind of be like, all right, kids, today yes. everything's going to be different. <laughs> and that, that's just not probably going to work out so well. No, I think that's what happens. The mom goes to a conference or something, and I always used to warn moms, don't go home and tell your kids you're going to change everything. Don't do that because you're so tempted to do that. Here you finally have all the answers. You know, what you don't know is a year from now, they won't have been all the answers. So <laughs> you're going to have to start out really slowly. I think they should take a month off and just read to their kids and enjoy their kids before they even implement any of this academic stuff that they're hearing about. Just get to know their kids. Let everybody take a deep breath from the stress and worry of it all and start enjoying one another. Like you said, Amy, there's nothing that can, that can undo a miserable mom in the lives of a, ch a child. Mom, the very first priority for a homeschooling mom is to let her children see her joy in them. Um, because a lot of times we're so stressed out with the day-to-day -day burden, kind of a burden of homeschooling, we take it so seriously that we, we love it, but we're carrying it as a burden. And we need to let go of that burden so that our children don't see themselves as, oh man, I'm a burden to my mom, but, more, but that they see the actual joy you really do feel in doing in homeschooling. Yeah, I try to make a point to at least once a day, look at each individual child and just assert <laughs> something positive to them like, oh, I just love homeschooling you, or, oh, I just yes. love getting to be able to read this book with you. And they live with me. They know I get frustrated. I lose my temper. I'm stressed out. And in those times, it's no, an opportunity to repent and ask their forgiveness and remind them that I need Jesus too. But I want to make sure mm -hmm. that they know I'm, I'm really glad to be doing this, um, even when it's mm -hmm. hard. You know, homeschooling yes. is the best yes. hard thing I do. I know. I think it's a great way that, you know, the Lord uses things to sanctify us. But I always say being with your kids is very sanctifying, but it's, it's a very positive way to be sanctified. Yes. Joyful. Oh, indeed. Well, Cindy, one of the things that I love about listening to the Literary Life podcast is seemingly no matter how esoteric the topic or random the author, you'll be like, oh yes, I've read him or I've read her. Or, in this other book I read, I read something related to it. And I know at the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned, you know, you came into homeschooling realizing kind of how even as a straight A student, you were basically uneducated in, in a, you know, in a broad sense. So you didn't come into motherhood having read all the things and having made all the connections. So one, mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit about that process and um, how would you encourage a homeschooling mom who's thinking, I, there's all these books I need to read and I don't know anything. How can she start, especially, you know, while the kids are still home? Yeah. Well, all education begins with where we don't know. So all of us are at that same point today. Today we are all at the place where what we don't, we're going to learn starting right here where we are at I don't know. So whether it's what, you know, you know, how much you know in the past, it doesn't really matter because it's about the future and what you're going to learn. I just kind of, I'm considered a plotter. Um, one of the things I love about the Literary Life podcast is I don't have to pretend that I didn't read all these books um, because I didn't know I was reading all these books either, but I just was plodding along with my, my kids. One of the reasons I have morning time, and Angelina talked about this recently at a conference we had, one of the reasons she liked morning time so much was it was an intersection of her own intellectual growth with her children's. So I'm having eight, you know, six, seven, eight, nine children, and I'm not getting to read as much as I did before. And I was reading, you know, I read a lot as a young mom and in the early years, but suddenly there's no more time 
for me to read. And I think there were about 10 years when I didn't read a book for myself, except what I was being fed through morning time and through reading aloud to the children and through just partaking of, of education with them. I mean, you read Ambleside year one, if, you, if you're familiar with that, and it is life-giving for an adult as well as a child. My brain was fed when I read that and on through all kinds of books and things. Um, so I just slowly plod, plod my way through book after book after book with my children. And then, you know, as my time freed up without, you know, I'd have time to read on my own. That was so exciting. And all of a sudden one day it was like, oh, you've read a lot of books. And, and it kind of was funny, but I know, I know so many homeschooling moms that that's their story. Um, I talk about it in Mere Motherhood, about going to England with a group of homeschooling moms. And between us all, we basically knew everything. I might know about this. She might know about the plants. She might know about the architecture. You know, I might know where the guy who wrote the book was born. <laughs> Put it all together, and it was like, you know, we were just like a lecture series for, e for each other. But it was all through homeschooling and our curiosity to, to learn, which had, had, had made that happen. So um, that's one of the beauties of homeschooling. You kind of get to repair the ruins of your own education as you teach your children. <laughs> Yes. And then speaking as a second generation homeschooler, it's exciting because I think what you said at the beginning was so important when you said we all start at the place of what we don't know because mm -hmm. education has to lead to humility and doxology, mm -hmm. which is Absolutely. why I called my site that because if we think in our education somehow we've arrived or we've achieved this great amount of knowledge and wisdom, then actually we haven't really been educated at all because the more that we learn, you know, Dr. Grant talks about education as repentance. The more that we mm -hmm. learn, the more we realize our need for Jesus, the more we realize how little we actually do know and how, how much there is yet to grow. And so even as a second, I mean, I am so thankful. My mom did a wonderful job in our education mm -hmm. and yet there's still books that I have yet to read or connections I have yet to make. And so even as this next generation of homeschooled children is being raised up, there's more and more to learn and grow and mm -hmm. like constantly grow in wonder and delight at our creator and, you know, humility realizing, well, wow, the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. <laughs> Oh, it is. Humility is key. And that's one reason it's important what we do with our kids, because if we are promoting our kids in a way to puff them up and make them think, and this is where that kind of random memorization of facts can really puff a child up. Whereas the, what, in a way, we're kind of hurting our children when we do that. This isn't to say they can't ever recite something or know a poem or memorize their math facts and get a pat on the back for that. But if our, their whole education is us being, puffing them up over some small piece of information that they have, um, we're stealing from them, them true education, which is humbling. And, and, and it's a wonderful place to be. It's wonderful. To, I always said to my kids, never be afraid to say, I don't know. And, and, and I tried to practice that. And I found when I started doing that, it was really, really hard at first when you're with someone and they say, do you know this? And you're, oh, yeah, 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 I read, I think, I, mean, I don't know. I, I, and then you're just, you don't have enough nerve to say, no, I don't know that. But once you're able to say that, then you've opened up this wide world of learning and it just becomes such a wonderful gate that you're opening that it gets, you get braver and braver about saying, no, I don't know that. Um, it's not, it's not an, uh, a, hum a humiliation in the way that we're debased. It's a humiliation in a way that we're enlivened. Yes. So Yes. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So it's actually a place of receiving grace when we're able to have that humility. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Well, Cindy, if, if someone came to you and asked, like, what do you think is the one most important thing to include in my morning time? Or maybe not the one most, but I have limited time. How do I choose? What would you say are the most important priorities for morning time? 
Well, right off the bat, when you asked that question, I thought, well, there's only one answer to that, you know, Jesus or <laughs> a <The> Bible. Bible. <laughs> but I actually have a different answer. And I think that would be singing. I think that singing would be the most important thing you could do as a family in morning time. It's not something most people really are comfortable doing. And it's not something that most of us have grown up doing. But between hymns and psalms and spiritual songs and, you know, choruses and even folk songs, the heritage and richness and joy that come into a family through singing together. And I say that as someone who does not sing well, um, is absolutely to me, probably one of the most important things you could possibly do in your family. So um, we, I always laugh, we had kids that sang well. We even at one point thought we'd hit the road. My husband's a great singer. <laughs> Uh, but then we had some kids, so they, a couple of those kids grew up and we were still singing every morning. It was starting to sound really badly. <laughs> and I, we started to quit. I was like, this is terrible. We're not doing this anymore. And even my husband, he go, oh, you guys sound badly. And one of my friends said, Cindy, you can't quit singing just because you sing badly. You should make a joyful noise. And so we did. We kept on singing. And um, later on, I was just teaching one student. And we would sing folk songs together and hymns together. And he, of course we used YouTube at that point. <laughs> I didn't have that in the early years, but it did help you know, cover a multitude of sins there in the voice. But he fell in love with that time that we spent every day, you know, just going through a folk song on YouTube or singing a hymn together. And that became his favorite part of the day. There is so much culture that is transmitted through music that, I, I genuinely think that that would be probably the most important thing we could do. That is oh, such a great answer. And when I hadn't considered, we, um, in our family, we do a lot of our singing of hymns and psalms in our family devotion time in the evening mm -hmm. uh, when my husband's there. In fact, right now, our church just switched over to a new Psalter hymnal. So we were like, well, we've got a lot of new <laughs> tunes to learn. So we're singing through the whole Psalter one one at a time. Um, but we don't normally do singing in our morning time. So maybe I'll have to think about a way to include that as well. Yeah, maybe add some folk songs to morning time since you're doing the Psalter in the evening. But but those um, those are great. Those are things that stick in your heart too. That music really has sticking power. It does. And I will never forget going to visit my great grandmother who had dementia. And she, you know, you get to a point where she couldn't remember who we were. But when we mm -hmm. would start reciting Psalm 23 or singing Amazing Grace, she would be able to participate fully with us. And so um, those, those hymns especially, or the Word of God and the Psalms, like, oh, what a wonderful thing to, to have in a different part of our brain, even from our, from our other memories. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I always say that morning time is for w when we're in a nursing home someday. Hopefully we won't be in a nursing home, but... Um, you never know. Things go wrong. You, your health falls apart. And to have something in your heart, even for those days left over, like you're saying, is not a, not a bad plan. <laughs> no, indeed. Well, this fall, because there are so many parents new to homeschooling, I'm asking each of my guests the same two questions here at the end. Um, the first one mm -hmm. is just, what are you reading lately? Okay, I just finished, as right before I jumped on here, a new book by Gina D'Alfonso called uh, Dorothy and Jack. It is about Dorothy Sayers and her relationship to C.S. Lewis, who is known to his friends as Jack. I enjoyed that book a lot. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to like it because it's a new book, and I was a little skeptical of how it was going to come across. But she did a fantastic job, and I thoroughly enjoyed reading that book. And... I'm also reading all kinds of millions of other books I have. I usually have about 10 books going. I, you know, I'm, I have streams in the desert and, oh, I don't even know what else I'm reading. I'm reading, I just finished um, for the podcast, Leaf by Niggle. So I'm reading some more of uh, Tolkien's short stories and um, those are so good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I have never heard of that Dorothy and Jack book, but I'm going to have to add that to my, to my book wish list because I, 
oh, I just love both of those authors so much and I would enjoy reading about their relationship with one another. I've been, 2020 has called for a lot of comfort reading. Um, so mm -hmm. I got out all of my old Lord Peter and I've been rereading okay. everything and just finished rereading Bussman's Honeymoon. And I was like, oh, oh. I forgot how beautiful this book is. Yes, so. I think Lord Peter has had a huge comeback in 2020. He's well needed. His skills are needed today. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, the second question I'm asking all of my guests this fall is, if you were talking to a new homeschool parent, what is what would you tell that new homeschool parent? Well, it's 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 really hard because a lot of homeschooling parents want you to tell them what to do. Just tell me what to do, tell me what to buy. And that those are really the wrong questions. And while I don't want to overwhelm them, I really would like them to think about why they're doing what they're doing rather than how or what because once they get work through that then it, it takes care of a lot of the what and how and how much money <laughs> uh, because you can start to put things in perspective because otherwise in, in this environment that we live in like you said already they're, they're gonna have a ton of stuff coming at them and a little educational philosophy can kind of guard their hearts from everything coming at them. They'll still be, they'll still be quite overwhelmed, but um, it really helps to think about why you're doing what you're doing and to think about the fact that um, your children, Charlotte Mason says that children are born persons. You're, you're a person, your children are persons. They don't learn in some mysterious way that you don't know about. You know how they learn because you know how you learn. And so if you could apply that to to what you're planning for them and not think, oh, I have to plan some really rigorous thing that, um, that, that'll smash this information into their head. I mean, we wish, don't we wish, don't we wish that information was just something we could smash in each other's heads, but that's not how God made us. And so it really does take, it, it really is a good use of time to get some of that straightened out before we, you know, we go spend some money. That is very wise and a good encouragement, even if you're not a, home, a new homeschooler. Yes. That's a good encouragement for all of us. Yeah. Yes. Well, Cindy, thank you so much for joining me today. Where can people find you all around the internet? Well, you can find me at cindyrollins.net. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter there. You just have to scroll to the very bottom of the page. And then you can get updates from me. Or you can find me on Facebook as Cindy Ward Rollins Writer. Uh, and that's basically where you can find me. And then uh, you can find me on the Literary Life podcast. And, and we have a webpage, theliterary.life. Fabulous. And I'll have all those links up in the show notes over at humilityanddoxology.com. All right. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye, Amy. Bye.